And we've got a new lady taking care of the overhead slides. I guess they're not overheads anymore. <laughs> it's all projectors. How is everyone doing today? Good. Good, good, awesome. Excited. Excited. I like it. I am excited to be here too. <coughs> last week was the last time preaching out of a notebook that I had started preaching out of probably almost 10 years ago, but it is full. So I'm on to a new one, one of my note ones. It has absolutely lovely. This one's leather. The other one's like a cheap $5 one. I got a dollar store or whatever. Cool. So who here remembers what we talked about last week? I know you weren't here. But who remembers what we were talking about last week? And what kind of our theme is right now? Happiness versus joy? Happiness versus... Uh, no, that was our first one. So last week was peace and apathy. So what we're doing is we're going through all of the fruits of the Spirit, and we're talking about what the fruit is and what its counterfeit is. Okay? Um, we started off with a bit of an introduction to all of this. Hannah preached on abiding which is one of the things that is required to growing the fruits of the Spirit in your life. And then the one that I preached shortly after that, the next one, we talked about um, the difference in the fruits. If you're looking at the, because in the fruit of the Spirit, you find every single one of these in the characteristics of God. They look different if you're doing it under the law versus under grace, right? And so we had to differentiate how, if you want to live under the law, like it says in Romans, then you're going to be judged by the law, you're going to do all that, and you're going to fail all the time. But if you live by grace, you're going to have the fruits of the Spirit, and they're going to look very different than what they look like now, in, in a lot of ways, and how we have apply them out. Um, so, to the, so last week we talked about peace versus apathy and how it affected different parts of our lives. We talked about how it affects relationships, finances, and our walks with God, right? Yeah. How if, if we have peace in our hearts, um, peace was one of the things that helps produce hope, peace and joy. Um, produce or yeah, peace and joy produce hope in our hearts. Hope produces faith, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. So these are one of those things where it's absolutely beautiful to have them in there. I'm really enjoying having my hands free. Preach, this is fabulous. Um, you hear me good, good. All right, so patience is what we're talking about today. Patience and its counterfeit complacency. Now, in the very first one, the joy versus happiness. Um, we, we talked about how oftentimes people pursue happiness rather than joy, right? Um, because I think happiness is the answer. In this one, people aren't, again, this is going to be a little bit like last week where it's peace and apathy. People aren't necessarily pursuing um, complacency. It's not a pursuit of people. It's not like they wake up in the morning and think, man, I wish I was more complacent. <laughs> right? It's just not something that people do. They do that with happiness. They wake up, I wish I was happier, I wish I had more stuff, da da da. But complacency isn't one of those things that you wake up and wish you had more of, okay? What it is, however, is so similar to patience, or at least we think it's so similar to patience, that in our pursuit of patience, in, in what we think is acting patiently, actually is acting apathetically, okay? That's one of the reasons why it's a counterfeit. It's not necessarily, it's not always about being pursued. Oftentimes it's something we end up pursuing um, subconsciously because it's what we think patience is supposed to look like. So today we're going to talk about patience, um, we're going to talk about complacency, we're going to talk about the differences between the two, how they affect our lives and how to grow um, patience in your life. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about, and I believe it's up there, is um, the first quote. Let's see, da, 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 all beautiful, good job. Okay, it says, if you have no patience for, for God's plan, you'll rock walk right into someone else's plan. This is beautiful because oftentimes God says, I've got a plan. Let's take a look at Abraham. Abraham was somebody who had a promise from God that him and, him and his wife, Sarah, would have a baby. And he got impatient. And what happened? Ishmael happened. Okay? I'm not saying that Ishmael was a bad thing. I'm not saying that that may or may not have been part of God's plan. But it wasn't a, an instruction given by God for him to go and lay with Sarah's maid. 
which produced Ishmael, right? So sometimes in life, we hear a promise from God. God's like, you know what? You're going to start a business, right? You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to have a church. You're going to get married. And sometimes we don't always trust God enough to persevere through those things. So um, I'm, I'll repeat that. If you have no patience for God's plan, you'll walk right into someone else's. Let's go to Galatians 5.22. That's where we're going to find um, this Bible verse that we're talking about, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Obviously, it keeps going down to self-control. But we're talking specifically today about patience, so I didn't put the other one up there. Um, so let's talk about what, what the definition of patience is. I absolutely love this. Um, in my Bible, under Galatians 5.22, I couldn't find the, the, the term for patience in there. It wasn't underlined, so I had to go to the King James, and even the King James doesn't quite narrow, or not the King James, a concordance. The concordance didn't even quite narrow it down, so I had to go to the original Greek, which is really cool. So the original Greek translation, I don't know if she put it in there. Hey, that's very, that's it, yeah. So, but I'm going to actually try and say this out to you. The Greek word is makrothomia. Makrothomia actually doesn't mean patience. Patience is the modern day translation for it. It's actually long suffering. Is, is, how the, uh, is how the King James Version translated it. I want to tell you something really cool. The King James Version actually didn't quite nail it either. The direct translation for patience is long passion. It literally translates long passion. King James put it to long suffering, and the NASB put it into patience. The beautiful thing is that every single one of those words, if you understand them properly, has a part to play in it. But if I tell you to have patience, like let's say, for example, I say at supper time, I'm going to give my nephews a chocolate bar. Okay? We often say, well, you have, if they're like, I want it now, you have to say, have patience, right? It's beautiful because patience actually requires you to be in control to actually have patience. You see, my nephew would not have any control about me giving him the chocolate bar. Therefore, saying have patience, although it be something that we often talk about, is actually not a completely accurate statement in and of itself. Because we're going to look at it. So patience, forbearance, internal and external control in a, different, in a difficult circumstance which control could exhibit itself by delaying an action, long suffering. Where about this does it say somebody else has control over you? See, sometimes in life we think, well, I have to have patience because something else out of my control is waiting to happen. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from business people or church leaders. It's like, well, we're just waiting for God to move. It's like, okay, hold on a sec. God says that we're his hands and feet. What are you supposed to be doing that's moving? Okay. Patience, I'm, I'm, I love this. We're going to go into a whole bunch of stuff, but I don't want to talk too much about it too quickly because I want to look at the counterfeit first. I'm going to do a few more descriptions. So patience, we've, we've got the one up there. I'm going to give you a couple other ones because you can find different translations for it. Another one is waiting sufficient time for expressing anger. This avoids the premature use of force, retribution that rises out of an improper anger. I love this because this is actually where you go if you're doing a study of the Greek um, this was actually from a Bible study um, section where people are doing really in-depth studies of the words. So this was one of the other um, translations. And I'll read it again. It says, waiting sufficient time before expressing anger. This, the avoid, there, this avoids the premature use of force or retribution that rises out of improper anger. I love it because... We often say, well, how is it that God is a righteous God and can be angry? It's because there's proper anger and there's improper anger. There's Bible verses in the New Testament that talk about passion being a bad thing. Don't put your passion in place. And it's like, well, there it says passion's bad here, but it says passion is good here. So what's the difference? It's talking about passion. It's when it talks about passion in a good way, it's actually talking about the same word that you find for long passion, which is patience. Patience under control. Or passion under control. So I'm going to give you another one. Able to withstand suffering for the appointed time. This is actually a very beautiful picture as well because we're going to see how this looks. But patience is able to withstand suffering for an appointed time. Okay? It means that if you have patience, you're not always, it's not always about being patient in the things that feel good. It's about being patient in the things that don't always feel good. It means sometimes there's things in life that hurt, that suck, that don't always line up with what we think would be good, things that don't make us happy, 
things that don't make us um, want to wake up in the morning and just explode with joy, those kind of things, but that's what we persevere through. That's what creates patience. And that's what patience is. So let's take a first-hand look at what this looks like. I, there's a Bible story in the Bible, and I always wondered why it is that Paul decided to wait so many days before telling this woman to bug her off. And I'm like, okay, well, you know what, God, I'm, today, I wasn't even looking for the answer to this, but let's go to it. Let's read it out. Let's go to Acts 16, 16 to 21. So it happened that we were going to the place of prayer. A slave girl, having a spirit of divination, met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. I want to stop there for a second. Is she saying anything that's not true? Did she, is she actually proclaiming something that's full on true? And yet, she's got a demonic spirit. This is something that's interesting to consider because oftentimes who we think are proclaiming the gospel and proclaiming the truth have something inside of them because here's the deal, the devil knows the truth, but his goal is to, to sell you a part of the truth, a counterfeit, so that you bite onto what he's got and then he's going to take you in another direction. She's talking the truth. Okay, we'll keep going. She continued doing this for many days. Okay, this wasn't one day. Can you imagine if I'm preaching and somebody keeps saying, this guy's here for God and he's telling everybody about Jesus. Like if she just started yelling and yelling and I'm trying to teach and y'all are trying to listen and somebody's doing that. I would get irritated after like an hour. These guys went on for days, many, many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her at that very moment. Okay, we'll pause there for a second. I absolutely love this because good job, you're doing a great job. For one, he didn't he didn't go after the girl. Didn't call her by name. He went after the spirit on the inside of her, which is what? It required him to be able to what? Recognize a problem. Recognize the spirit. That's one of the gifts of the spirit. Okay? This is one of the things that we need to be walking in. But the other thing that he exercised with that gift of the spirit was patience, which was a fruit of the spirit. Okay, so patience is the reason he waited many days, because it was waiting for, he was suffering till the appointed time. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, the Bible explains it to you without you even realizing it, why he waited, because here's the deal. He went on for many days preaching the gospel. How many people did he reach in those many days? Lots and lots and lots. Let's go to the next one. What happened as soon as he cast them out? But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. They, if they had cast her out, that demon out sooner, they could have dealt with it. They could have dealt with the evil, but they would have missed those many days of preaching the gospel. Because as soon as they did, they were seized. Let's go to the next one. And when they had brought them out, out or brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews. And are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. And so they end up going to jail. But I, I, I never understood why they waited many days. I've heard many preachers talk about it. And it's just kind of like, well, they just waited. They just did their own thing. But it's a beautiful picture because God had a better plan. There was something called patience. I guarantee you, it says he was greatly annoyed. That, that's another word for suffering. It's irritating. If you have a mosquito bite, it's annoying. It's irritating, okay? If you have a woman who's screaming at the top of her lungs while you're trying to tell people about Jesus, it's irritating. But patience produced a wait time before passion was exuded and he cast out a demon. See, sometimes we're going to run into things in life where, you know what, God has given us the authority to deal with something, but is it the right time to? Because when we do, there may be consequences. See, Paul was fully okay with going to jail. He was willing to give his life for the gospel, and so are we. But even though he was willing to give his life for the gospel, he was still listening to the Father in the midst of that willingness. Because God had a plan for those few days while he was preaching before he went to jail. Okay, let's talk a little bit about complacency. There's not going to be any notes for this right away, so we'll just hang out there for a few minutes. Complacency. I'm going to give you the definition, a few different definitions. This first one is from the Oxford languages. So complacency is showing smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. Let's say it again. So complacency is showing smug 
or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. You know, another, another way to look at this, if you're not being critical of yourself, it means that you're not worried about growth. Because you're not worried about change. It means I, it, when you are uncritical of something, it means that you would, are okay and you think it's perfect. If I don't, I, I made a roast beef, or a prime rib last night in my smoker. It was delicious. That was, that was a meal that turned out really good. I also made ribs last week. My ribs didn't turn out quite the way I wanted to, and so I was critical of them, and I figured out some ways to improve them. Okay, so if you are, if you have something that you don't want to change, you don't critique it. But if you have something that needs to change, that needs to grow, you're constantly critiquing and, and tweaking and doing your different, different methods, different ways of going about things. How do I do better? And your life is obviously more um, intricate than a piece of meat on a barbecue. But my point is, is that if you are complacent, you think you're perfect and you're not changing. I'm going to give you another one, um, and this one came out of the Merriam, Merriam Webster. I forgot to write that down in my notes, but this one came out of the Merriam Webster. It says, marked by self satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies, marked by complacency or self satisfied. I absolutely love this because. Um, I'm not gonna go into it today, but I went and actually studied the original Greek for this as well, and it's really cool why they came up with this word. We won't talk about it today, because we don't have time. But if you wanna know what uh, complacency, where that word came from, it's a really fun study. Feel free to go take a look at it. But marked by self-satisfaction, especially when, especially when unaccompanied, or accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers and deficiencies. Okay, complacency is so dangerous because you're walking along and you may not even realize there's someone to your left or to your right that's working against you. You may not recognize in the spirit realm the things that are happening around you because you're not operating in patience, you're operating in, in complacency. Complacency in our lives does a few things that create powerlessness, confusion, and decay in our lives. Let's look at what complacency could look like in our lives. So those three things, are what happens if you operate in complacency. So I'll say them again. It's powerlessness, confusion, and decay. And specifically decay because what happens if, if you sit stagnant for too long? You know, if you, if, if you have a really beautiful puddle of water and you just let it sit outside in a bucket, the first day you would drink from it. Probably even the second day. But after you've left it for three or four weeks, what was in a good state at one point is now in a worse state than it began with. You see, some people reach a level where it's like, you know what, I'm content here, I'm happy, I'm good, and you might be at a great level, you might be changing the world, you might be making differences, you might be doing that, and then you stop. See, the thing is, is you don't maintain this. If you stop moving, you actually start decaying. Complacency brings decay, which means that everything you've worked for, everything you've grown, everything you've built, everything around you starts to crumble because there's no more growth, there's no more life, there's no more movement. So some of the effects of complacency. Oh, that's a little tough to read, isn't it? Okay, well, I'll read them out and maybe you can get so one of, I'm going to go through a whole list of them, and then I'll explain some of them. So shallow relationships and damaging relationships are an effect of complacency. Okay? How many Christians or people do you know have been not living a powerful lifestyle because they're around relationships that hold them back, around relationships that are, are looking at them and saying you're useless, around relationships that say, you know what, I'm a person and you're connected to me, so if you want to stay connected to me, you can't go do what you're passionate about, okay? That's being around people who have no passion. Complacency, it will actually damage relationships. Um, and it will, it will create damaging relationships and shallow relationships. How many times have you been um, in a spot where you walk in and you meet new people and they're like, hey, how are you? I'm going to give you a big hug. I'm going to welcome you. I'm going to treat you well. And then all of a sudden you start talking about deep things and it's like, I want nothing to do with you. 
How often do the relationships that the Bible actually says we're supposed to have not happen amongst brothers? You know why that is? Is because complacency has become our comfort zone rather than patience. We don't want to feel pain. We don't want to feel correction. We don't want to feel somebody that's looking into our lives and saying, no, 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 if you come too close, you're going to see my marriage and I don't want that. If you come too close, you're going to see my business and how it's not doing good and I don't want that. If you come too close, you might see that I've got issues in my family with my kids. You might see that I've got issues in my church with other people. If you come too close, you're going to see how dirty I really am. And you know what happens is, is we put everybody out here and then on Facebook we say life is great, feeling joy, feeling awesome. And what does that mean? It means that we're putting ourselves in a spot of complacency. Because if, you know what, we're having a big thing in medicine right now where lots of people are committing suicide. You know why that is? Because we're too complacent. Because the people who commit suicide are too complacent. And because the people who care about the people who commit suicide are too complacent. There's no passion for the people out there who, and you know what, it's not just passionate about don't commit suicide, it's, it's passionate, why aren't you moving forward? Why aren't you growing? Why aren't you stepping into something that you are called to be? Where's your hope in life? Um, you become satisfied and you don't challenge the next one. You become satisfied. If you are satisfied with your life, and you decide that I'm done, that's not good. You'll literally be done. One of the, one of the big common things with farmers you'll hear oftentimes is they work, farmers are some of the hardest working people I know. They work crazy amounts of hours, they do amazing work, and then what happens when they retire? They stop. A lot of them stop doing anything. And then they were strong, they were healthy, they, they could lift more than I can lift. They can do all kinds of different things. But then within the day they retire, in 10 years, they're dead. Why is that? Because they stopped. They became complacent. They were satisfied with what they did in life, and then they were done. I don't want to be somebody who lived for the glory days, and that's it. I want to go from glory to glory to glory to glory. It's like, oh yeah, this was great 10 years ago. We had power, we had revival, we had all this. Cool, let's go to the next level. What does today's glory look like? What is God doing today? Okay, well we did that. All right, beautiful. Okay, God, we've achieved this level. We're at this spot. We've got churches around the world. Great. What's the next step? What do we do now? How do we improve? How do we do better? How do we finish this race well? I don't want to stop 10 feet from the finish line. Next one is you don't pursue excellence. If you are somebody who is complacent, excellence is probably far from you. The next one is really important. You can't lead well. If you are complacent, you don't lead well. And you know what? Every Christian is called to be a leader. It's okay. I'll go to that one too. If you are a Christian and you don't think you are a leader, you are genuinely confused because light stands out in darkness and salt amplifies flavor. If you are either one of those things, you're leading somehow. You don't deal with spiritual problems. You, you, you write them off. Or you know what you do? This is really popular nowadays. Um, you, you create a prayer meeting. And you, you, you do your, your uh, Christian diligence, and you pray. You, you sit down, and you do a quick prayer meeting. You're like, We're going to gather together. We're going to do this prayer thing, and we pray once, and then it's done. And we think we've done our job. Well, we've done our Christian duty. We lifted it up in prayer. We gave it to God, and we said, all right, now you deal with it. And you forget that that is the first part of prayer. Prayer requires two things from you. One, it requires a request. And if you're doing it in this kind of prayer, it requires a request. And then it requires a willing vessel to move. If you're asking God for something, there's different kinds of prayer. You can be praying and worshiping God. You can, there's different prayers. There's all kinds. If you're asking something of God, it requires a request and it requires an action. Okay? If you, all you're doing is saying, God, I just want you to move. We're just going to come together as the church and worship and do all of this stuff. Great. Who's moving? What's the next step? Don't be complacent. 
Because here's the deal. Well, I don't want to get too close to those people. I don't want to get too close to the ones who commit suicide. I don't really want to go out of my way to try and hunt them down and tell them the truth. Here's the thing. I know a lot of people who won't share the truth because they're scared someone won't like them. I've had people, I have had pastors tell me, you're preaching too aggressively. And you know what I did? All I did was preach the Holy Spirit to a group. Wow, it was a youth pastors meeting. We had Catholics. We had um, Pentecostals. We had, I think, some Lutherans. We had a whole mix of uh, evangelicals, a whole mix of these youth groups. And, they, and then I was like, I'll preach. I got no problems preaching. So I preached a message on Holy Spirit. And it was beautiful because I said, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're tired of living a life that's powerless, and you want to be effective in the kingdom of God, I want you to come up. And every single kid from the Catholic youth group came up. A bunch of other kids from the, from the churches that don't necessarily preach a lot about Holy Spirit came up. None of the Pentecostal kids came up. The Pentecostal pastor came to me later and said that was too hard. It's not that he's going to hell. It's not that he's wrong. He's complacent. Complacency puts you in a spot where you think you've arrived and you're already better than everybody else, but we don't need to bother them with the things they don't need to care about because we, they may not like us. That's complacency. It breeds powerlessness. That's why none of those kids got up. They're aware of the Holy Spirit and they're aware it's there. They believe they have it on the inside of them and therefore there's no work to be done. There's nothing to do with you. This is the danger of complacency is it makes the church powerless. You don't deal with spiritual problems. I put that one through that one already. I could talk on this for, I could literally go through this and show you example after example of how this works, but I'm going to keep going. Let's go to the next one. You take your eyes off the vision and the calling God has on you. I know a lot of Christians who don't go to church. I know a lot of Christians who say, well, I just can't find somewhere to get plugged in. It's like, you know what? I don't care if you don't agree with 50% of what the pastor says. Find somewhere to get plugged in. You know what? If you are wise enough, if you have enough of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you to, just, to discern right from wrong, go get plugged in and influence people from a servant level in a church. Have a small group and start teaching people. You know what? If you're passionate about God, it breeds passion. It's true. If you think that just because, well, you know what? I can't be in a church that's, that doesn't have passion. Well, you know what? Then you're never going to find a church. Go start one. But don't sit at home and do nothing. It's not a good idea. If you are unchurched, you are becoming, you. I'm going to say this. If you're unchurched, you're not powerful. Your power is limited. You're not walking in unity. You're, and you actually can, you're actually walking in a bit of pride because you're thinking you're so high above everybody else that you will not submit to another leader. That's what complacency breeds. It's why you don't see people who don't go to church being useful in the kingdom of God. There are now there are some times where people will say, I'm not going to church, but I'm also running away to a cave, and all I'm doing is praying for a season. And now that's consecrating and setting apart. That's not what I'm talking about. If you're sitting at home and all you're doing is praying 24-7 and you're so full of the Holy Spirit that you touch someone and they get healed, great. But God's not going to keep you there. Because every time you do that, God draws people to you because you were not designed to be selfish with God. God is not a tool you get to keep hidden just between you and God. If you get full of Him, you need to be useful. Every time the disciples got power, they used it. If you think you get to hoard it all to yourself, God's going to, God's going to say, you know what? Not going to happen. He's going to draw people to you. You won't be able to if you're walking in that kind of power. People are going to be like, there's something different about you. What's going on? I won't go into the story. The story about is beautiful. Let's go to the next one. You realize, to, or uh, you refuse to take your authority. You have authority as a Christian. You see, if, 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 if it was uh, somebody who was walking in complacency and that person was screaming it out, because they were worried to deal with it, they probably wouldn't have cast out the demon. They would have had ushers move them away from the crowd. 
complacency. You're not dealing with the authority God gave you. You're not in front of a crowd calling a demon out of somebody. Well, what if I scare off one of the people in my church? Then they're not actually here for the right reasons. Because if you want people to see what real Christianity looks like, it means casting out devils. It means healing the sick. It means being bold. It means being willing to go to jail for your faith. It means persevering through pain, which is what patience talks about. Let's go to the next one. You lack boldness. This one's deadly. You don't have boldness. You, ne you can't walk out the authority God gives you. Not only do you not walk in your authority, you refuse to take your authority, but you can't anymore. Without boldness, you don't take your authority. Why do you think the disciples, even after having been beat up and broken and thrown out of the city, they come back in and what's the first thing they ask God for? More boldness. Why is that? Because boldness is what breathes the ability to do what God has called you to do. Let's go to the next one. Step one. Your comfort zone. You will stay limited so long that those limitations become your comfort zone. You become comfortable with being useless. <laughs> it's true. You know what? I, I would, I'm going to put a question out, and I'm not going to accuse anybody, but I want, if you're listening online or if you're here, I want you to ask yourself, I've been going to church for how long? What have I done? What have I done to change the kingdom? What have I done to better it? How do I treat the waitress after church? How do I treat the guy on the, on the street who's cut me off on the street? How do I treat the business guy who speaks poorly about me behind my back? How do I treat the coworker who, who, who looks at me and, and does his best to shame me? How do I treat the Christian who doesn't like me because of my personality? Well, you know what, he's just not my type of person and therefore I'm just gonna leave him alone. Yeah, okay, no. God created diversity for a reason. You don't have to make them your best buddy buddy, but you need to love them. Don't, yeah, you don't, you, this is, you don't want to let that become your, your comfort zone. Um, you become passionless. Without passion. I love that patience's definition is long passion. Because the opposite of patience is complacency. Or the counterfeit is complacency. Complacency is literally a lack of. There's no drive to change or look inward or critically think about yourself or others around you. <coughs> Actually, that's not true. You can think of you, you'll, if you're complacent, you'll think critically of others around you, but you'll never think critically of yourself. Let's go to the next one. You become fearful of failure. These are all effects of complacency. Every single one of these affects your daily lives. These are monsters in your life, monster things. If you have, if your fear of failure, that is huge because the proverb says that a righteous man may fall seven times but will rise again. If you're scared to fall, you'll never rise. You have to be willing to fall. And it's not like it's not like the Bible says. Well, you 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 may experience persecution, you may experience trials, it says you will. You know what that means? You'll probably fail a time or two along the way, and God loves it. But you know what? I love it at work when one of my managers makes a boo-boo. I get so excited because it's like, yes, a teaching moment. I get to teach something. I get to look at you and say, hey, this is the mess that was made. How are you going to clean it up? And they get, get so I've had them get really angry and grumpy with me. And I'm like, no, 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 go back and fix it. They go, back, they go fix it, they come back, and all of a sudden everything's good again. And I'm like, what you were doing is you were ashamed of the fact that you didn't live up to your own expectations. But when somebody gave you the opportunity to clean up your own mess, you are now responsible for it next time. And you're more likely to not screw up again. Because why? You were powerful enough to clean up your own mess. Somebody else didn't have to clean it up for you. I love teaching moments. I love it when, 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 even with myself, I hate it in the moment when I screw up. I did not like that I messed up those ribs. This is a very simple one. I do screw up in lots of other areas, but 
the ribs was, I hated that I messed it up, but I loved the opportunity to do it better because how much better does it feel when the next time you encounter the same challenge, you excel? That's perseverance. Not necessarily what we're talking about today, but perseverance will be something we talk about at some point. Um, all of these things, does that sound like a powerful people to you? Does that sound like God's people to you? Does that sound like who God created us to be as his church? Is this a good rep representation of who God is? This is just a lack of patience. This is just simply going with apathy rather than patience. Let's go to the parable. Um, let's go to the parable of the men with the talent. So it's Matthew 25, 14 to 30. For it is just like a man, or for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who has called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Actually, I'm not going to read through all of this because that'll take too much time. Does everybody here know the, the story of the parable with the talents? The one, the five, the ten? This is the last thing that one of the biggest and most deadly effects of complacency is you start to fear your maker in an evil way. See, the man with the, with the ten talents reproduced himself. The man with the five talents reproduced himself. The man with the one talent feared his maker in an evil way and he became complacent with that one talent. And what did his master say of him? Be gone from me, you evil and wicked servant. It is so dangerous to sit in complacency because what it does is, is you actually get scared to grow closer to God. You get scared to ask the questions that are, that are tough to people. You get scared to say, is it okay? Is slavery, slavery actually a good thing? You know how many people I talk to about slavery and it's like, how dare you say it's good? I'm like, well, the Bible has a beautiful definition of slavery. As a matter of fact, I would prefer slavery biblical standards to what we have today because slavery means you work for seven years for the debt that you're in debt for and after that, whether you paid it or not, you're free. I love how God designed absolutely everything. But you know what? If you're so scared to go up to your pastor and say, you know what? What really is this slavery thing? Or your pastor says, we don't talk about it. No, it's just bad. Leave it alone. There are so many topics like this in the church that we just don't talk about. Sex. That's another one. Family. Homosexuality. All of the big tough movement, all the big tough topics that nobody wants to talk about. We're like, well, you know what? The government doesn't really want us to say anything. The people don't really want us to say anything. We might offend someone. You know what? You might offend someone, but you may also plant a seed of truth in their heart to the point where God can water it and bring them out of something where 50% of them commit suicide. The answer to a problem isn't to avoid it. It's to confront it, deal with it, present an answer, and let them choose. Christians who go up and say, well, you know, you're homosexual, so you're going to burn in hell. It's like, you know what? That is not how you deal with it. That's what you call condemnation. If you go up to somebody and you present a problem without presenting a solution, it's condemnation. But if you come up and you present a problem and then you present the solution and you say, this will solve all your issues, now that's conviction. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes up to you and says, ah, 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 Jeremiah, you had anger towards somebody you had no right to have anger towards. What should you do? And then he brings up the Bible. He talks about the God's word in my heart. Brings it up. He brought a problem. He brought a solution. And said, you get to choose. And guess what? I get to choose to have a repentant heart. You're right. I'm wrong. I'll move on. I'll do it better next time. But if we stay complacent, we're going to say, oh, yeah, I know so-and-so's marriage is failing. Whatever. They'll work it out. I know so-and-so's business isn't doing good. I, I know that their reputation in the city is that of a horrible business person because they don't deal honorably with anybody, but that's not my problem. You know what? Actually, it is. If you're, if you're a Christian, it's your responsibility to come. It says iron sharpens iron. 
It's not, if you just leave a piece of iron sitting out in the street, it's not gonna sharpen anything. It takes a grinding, it takes a working, it takes something that is willing to say I'm uncomfortable. I love the definition of patience because it's willing to be uncomfortable for a length of time. Let's talk about patience now. We looked at all the negative side effects. Let's talk about the good stuff. Patience. Oh, Shannon just put them all in. Beautiful. Okay, but we'll go through them one by one. Your relationships are restored and they grow. When you cease to be complacent, you get powerful relationships. Relationships you can put pressure on and they'll sustain. The next one is you are you are not satisfied and you are and with those around you who aren't growing and you're not satisfied with yourself not growing. It literally irks you that nobody else around you is willing to grow past the point that they're in. That means you've got a passion on the inside of you. That doesn't mean you go and rebuke them. That's where patience comes in. It means you wait for the right time. You suffer through it to the right time. When, when they will come to you and say, I've got a problem and I need help because I can't deal with it anymore. Then you know that they've been struggling. And you know what? There's times when as a leader you have to go and intervene. But the part of patience is willing to wait it out. The next thing, you're willing to pursue excellence, especially if it takes time. Excellence doesn't grow overnight. You're not going to get a 100-year-old tree in three days. You want to build a tree house, you're not going to do it on a twig. You're going to wait till that tree is big and strong and can contain the weight of a tree house. You deal with spiritual things in the right time, in the right place, in the right season. I, I, the example of this, I love it, is Paul. Paul waited until the right time to deal with that spiritual demand, the oppressed person. You stay focused on the vision. If you've got patience on the inside of you, you're able to stay focused on the vision. Why? Because sometimes if we have a vision and we don't see it happening right away, we get complacent and we throw the vision away. I know churches, I know businesses who have vision, mission, and value statements that they have no clue what they're about. And why is that? Because in the beginning, they had passion, they had motive, they had everything they needed going for them, but they didn't have patience, they weren't willing to persevere through a season of growth. And then when that happened, they became complacent, and now they no longer have sight of the vision. Why am I even doing this? That's the danger of complacency, guys. You stand in your authority, is the next one. It's a beautiful thing. If you've got patience, Patience, you cannot be patient if you don't have authority. You literally can't. Because you have to be in control of what your response is in order to have patience. If somebody is rude to you, you're in control of your response. Which is getting very, very close to self-control, which we will talk about in a few weeks. But patience is when you have the ability to deal with something but choose to do it in the proper timing. It means you're willing to suffer through an issue for X amount of time. It's a beautiful thing. How do you know the proper timing? How do you know? Well, how did Paul know? It comes from abiding in Christ. It comes from embracing failure. And it comes from listening and obeying the Holy Spirit. Through that, you become full of passion. And passion that's under control, the godly kind. Patience is passion under control. If you're going to write something down, write that. It's passion under control. We're going to look at a few Bible verses now. And I'm going to show you guys a little bit about this. Let's go to Romans 2.4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? This is talking about God's character in this particular one where Paul's writing to the Romans. And God is the ultimate example of showing us patience. 
Somebody asked me, why do bad things happen to good people? For the same reason good things happen to bad people. Because the world has evil in it, and God has set an appointed time for when he's going to deal with it. Up until then, God's suffering with you through everything you go through. Why do you think Jesus had compassion and he wept when someone died? And he knew he was going to get back up. He was suffering with someone. Welcome to patience. God is the one who showed us patience right from the beginning. He knew there was evil. He didn't wipe it out. He's saying, that's coming. I'm coming. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to do this, but in the right time. People still need to choose. People, I'm giving people the opportunity to choose me. You want to see the ultimate form of patience? That's God. God is patient. Long passion. God is not a lot. There's no lack of passion in God's heart. God is full of passion, but it's controlled passion. He literally has the power to do anything he wants. He puts it under control for a plan he put in place. So that he can be a God who honors his word. It's, it's crazy. Let's go to Romans 9, 21 to 26. Or does the potter, or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and, and another for common use? Okay, let's go back for a sec. <clears throat> to make one from one lump, one vessel for honorable use, and one for another common use. I want to just deal with something that's off topic real quick. There is nothing in God's word that says life is what we consider fair. God has designed people for common use, and God has designed people for honorable use. They are both equally valuable to God. There is not one that contains greater value in terms of what, what you're worth to God. Jesus paid the same price for the honorable one as the common one. It was his life. Okay, That's where we get issue. We put greater value on people who are honorable than on people who are not. That's not how God works. Honor is not, not necessarily tied to value. If you have great honor for someone, that's awesome. But if you take an honorable person and a, and, and a common person and you put them in a room and you have to choose who you're going to preach the gospel to, the Bible says that we need to be able to do it in a way that's impartial. You can't pick based on social status, on stature, on finances, on any of that. Why? Because it's about value. Both of them are worth, were worth Jesus' life on the cross. But that doesn't mean we all have the same role. There are, that's why God gave one talent to one, five to another, and ten to another. Because the one with ten was designed to run ten. He'll be rewarded for running ten. The one who was, was called to do five run, was able to do five properly. And God gave them cities. But he got the same honor from God for doing a smaller amount of work. Because obedience was what he was looking for, not the quantity. Okay, we'll keep going. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Okay, endurance and patience are two things that are talked about huge in this one. God was the first one to show this towards his people. Let's go to the next verse. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. Okay. Even us, whom he has called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Keep going. There's two more verses. And as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who is not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. You see, before Jesus, God was also already exuding patience. Because at one point, we who were Gentiles were not called God's people. We were not called beloved. We were not called those things. But God had a greater plan. And that plan was to say, you are still in my heart. 
And so patience was the thing. Patience was the long-term vision for the greater success. Willing to withhold your power until the right moment. Let's go to the next one, Ephesians 4.1. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 10. You're right. I don't know. In working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time, at the acceptable time, oh, patience again, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited, but in everything commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, okay, whoa, 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 same sentence, bad things, good things, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness, for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. This was what God called us to be patient and endure through. Oh, this changes perspectives. This means that there are bad things you're going to feel, but when you do, you bring glory to God. You get to, you essentially are, by going through, it pleases God. It says that it pleased God when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus suffered. That's patience. He suffered until the appointed time. Jesus actually was taken before they were able, to, before he died naturally on the cross. God took him. He breathed his last. But you know what's beautiful is he had to suffer so that the long-term goal, which was to reach everybody he created, could come into play. <coughs> and then we complain because work is hard. <laughs> we complain because it's not fair. That guy makes more money than me. I wish I could have a trader. I wish I could have a nice car. I wish I could have a nice house. God, how come you're not blessing me more? Patience is not about getting. It's about giving. Everything about the fruit of the Spirit is what you give to God, not what He gives to you. The fruit of the Spirit is grown by God alone. He's the only one who can produce it in your heart. Let's go to the next one. Ephesians 4.1 Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility, humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Okay, that's beautiful. With patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Patience means they're bugging you. Christians, brothers, people that we call our own are bugging you. And it says what? Patience. Patience with them. Suffer through it for my sake, he says. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, strength, tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to per preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that's it. This is absolutely crucial to our walks with God. Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to agree with you. Not everybody has a demon on them because they don't agree with you. It might just mean, look, for the sake of the relationship, we need to part ways. Paul and Timothy, was it Paul and Timothy that did that? Paul, Paul and Silas. They just went separate ways. They didn't stop being saved. But sometimes you have to do what you got to do in order to preserve the unity of Christ, because let it not be said of me that I caused division of another church. 
that I caused somebody to stumble, that I caused somebody to do something because I was impatient, because I let my passion take over where patience should have persevered. Because I let an unhealthy and ungodly anger rise up and take control in a time when it should have been perseverance. Let's go to Colossians 1, 9-12. This is my last Bible verse, I think. Yeah. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfast and patience. So, let's go back. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So he's strengthening you and giving you power for the attaining of all steadfast and patience. He's giving you power so you can put it under control. Okay? Joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. I love this study. How do you grow patience? How do you grow it in your life? First thing is recognize what patience is and where it's lacking in your life. Giving you guys a whole bunch of examples and those examples are a small portion of what that really does in your life. But recognize what, what, you're, what you're doing in your life. Are you walking in patience or are you walking in complacency? The second one and I think this is the most important, is abide in Christ and pray every day. Without this step, you will never, ever, 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 ever get the fruit of the Spirit. If you aren't tied in to the <coughs> rivers of living water, you cannot grow your tree. The beautiful thing, I love the analogies because they always fit together, but we're considered a branch that was grafted into a tree. If that branch isn't grafted into the right tree, it's not going to grow the right fruit. Abiding literally means being tied to, living in. You could, you could look at it as being you being a branch, being plucked into a big tree. And now you're getting the nutrients from that tree. That tree is, is, is grabbing from the waters of life and you're growing. But if you unplug from that tree and you plant into the enemy's tree, you're going to get a candy tree. All the goody and all the flavor with none of the benefits. And nothing but a tummy ache and cancer and destruction and everything that's evil comes from. The next one is walk in your authority and, do, and, or, and walk in your authority. You don't have patience without authority. And then four, ask God for more and more and more and never stop asking God for more. Give me, a, give me the ability to be more patient with your people, to be more loving, to be kind, to be generous, to be faithful, to be all of the fruits of the Spirit. Give me more and more and more and more and more. I got two, four minutes. I'm gonna, I was going to share this at the beginning, and I didn't. I don't often get dreams. God talks to my wife more through dreams. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're taking notes, you probably don't need to take the rest. This is... This is a closing statement. Um, I don't usually get dreams, but last night I got one that was so real, so surreal to me, and it was my wife and I, we were sitting in a restaurant. And it's, 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 it's hard to explain like a cloud of darkness around our table, so we've got, this, we've got this little candle sitting on our table. And all around us is darkness. It's like, it's like, feel it and you can see the evil in it there's perverseness there's 
there's there's nakedness, there's drunkenness, there's there's adultery, there's idolatry. All of this stuff is happening in this restaurant. And we've got our light shining. And all of a sudden, every, these people, these, these arms and these people are grabbing at our table saying, put your light out, put your light out, put your light out. And uh, my wife and I just look at each other. And it's like, no. I don't need to. I know who I am. I'm going to, and that song, this little light of mine came into my head. And I said, I'm just going to let my light shine. And what happened is that light broke through, and we persevered through these grabbings, through these people. And what happened was, somebody else at a restaurant who had seen our light and was scared to light theirs because they had given in to the arms, lit their candle. And then somebody at the other end of the restaurant said, oh, more candles, and they lit. And all of a sudden, tables all through this restaurant started lighting up and lighting up. And what happened was, is the enemy who was naked, who was broken, who was sinning and felt comfortable in the darkness, no longer felt comfortable around us. They had to leave the restaurant. The enemy couldn't stay just because we didn't rebuke them. We didn't tell them to leave. We lit our candle and we let the light expose the darkness. And what happened was others followed suit and eventually there was so much light in the restaurant that the nakedness and the perverseness and the idolaters all had to leave because there was no more safety. There was no more hiding. What was evil was evident and what was good was evident. Righteousness shown through people living, not just people preaching. Yeah, that's good. And God showed me some powerful things through that dream. Because it's like, we're not just called to just sit and preach. It's not the preacher who walks into the restaurant and starts saying, you're going to burn in hell for this. And you know what? There is a time for a hell and brimstone kind of message. But you know what's really powerful is when you as a Christian is sitting at a Christian at a restaurant and your waitress is running behind and you're not complaining about how long the food takes to get to you. You're looking at the waitress and saying, you're doing a fabulous job today. You know what that does to the Christian behind you that hurt, that is complaining? It brings conviction. You living righteously brings conviction to people who aren't because why? Good exposes evil. We're supposed to live a lifestyle that exposes. We're not just supposed to say it. We're supposed to live it because the light on the inside exposes those around us. It's why evil doesn't want relationship with us. It's because when they do, all of a sudden, things get exposed. I never understood, like one of my callings in life, I never understood why whenever I got to know people, it's like I always found the problems. Always, always, always. I never understood it. And then one of the things that God started showing me as I matured as a Christian is that it's not that you were looking for them. It's that you lived a lifestyle that made them uncomfortable. It's because you held a standard to God's word that they weren't holding. And what happened was, is two things. One, they change, or two, they leave. Let's be people that shine so bright we don't even have to say a word. We just love God. We're obedient. We're powerful. And all we have to do is live our lives. And everything around us will change. I'm going to end with this prayer. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for every single person that's here. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing and what you continue to do. Lord God, I just ask for an outpouring of patience in our lives. And Lord God, I ask that as we start to pour out and as we start to go out and take this city, as we start to pray aggressively, as we start to carry your word in our hearts like it's gold, like it's more than gold, like it's the only thing that we're wanting to live for. I thank you, Father, Lord God, that as we do that and as we start to encounter perseverance, that you would breed patience in us. Thank you, God, that you would give us the ability to wait through, to persevere through problems, Lord God, so that when the time comes, we can rise up in passion and take control for the kingdom of God. We can rise up in passion and be obedient to what you've called us to be. I thank you, Father, that today, you, or this week, you give us opportunities to walk out that passion. 
and that we would not be afraid to fail, but we would take a challenge head on, and if we fail, we would rise again, repent, and move forward. I thank you, God, for who you are and what you're doing. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your Holy Spirit and what you did on the cross, Jesus. And I thank you, God, for all of these beautiful people. We love them all very much. In Jesus' name.